Puebla, it's an absolute honor and a privilege to be here today to talk to you about the future of education in Mexico. And I'd love to talk to you as well about creating exponential humans for Mexico. Uh, to talk about exponential humans for Mexico, to create the number one country in the world right here. You already have the number one warmest people in the world, the kindest people in the world. I love your country, truly with my heart. This is a great, great nation. I also want to give a shout out to some YPO friends up there that I, I met actually about a year ago and just appreciate the YPO organization. I've been a member of YPO as well. I want to say why education is something so close to my heart. And I think in Mexico, people understand the importance of education. We see with a war going on right now, uh, two million people have left Ukraine as refugees uh, over the last month, five weeks. My family were refugees out of a country called Latvia uh, during the Second World War. They jumped on a ship, they arrived in South Africa with absolutely nothing. Our family were very poor growing up. And me and my three older brothers, we slept on the floor on very thin mattresses. And my father worked nights and weekends. He had three jobs. He did everything he could uh, to save the money so we could all go to the best private schools and go to university. He got seven degrees. My oldest brother got uh, seven degrees. My next brother's got five degrees. I've got six degrees. All of us got so educated and we saw how that education changed everything. Our family became very, very successful. They're all over the world now. So firsthand, we saw the power of education. There's a quote that I love, and it says, if you want to do the impossible, you have to see the invisible. If you want to do the impossible, you have to see the invisible. Every entrepreneur knows this. Everybody knows that it's ideas that manifest, that come from nothing, that change the world. The invisible in this case that I want to talk about is the hidden potential inside every single young Mexican. That is really what we need to realize and develop if we want to do the impossible for Mexico. So this is changing. I come from this country. Uh, South Africa, the most unequal country in the world. And it's very similar to Mexico in many, many ways. We've got about 60 million people in our country, and you have these dividing lines. And what we need to do is move that highway all the way to the right. And the only way we're going to do that is if every single person living in those equivalent of favelas, etc., were to develop their full potential. And what do we know all of us who've been entrepreneurs, who've built things, every single problem has a solution. This problem has a solution. There is no doubt that that can be changed. And we set out to prove that that could be changed. This inequality in our country leads to very great anger. And these are pictures from our newspapers in recent years um, in South Africa. And you see that jobless youth are losing hope. In South Africa now, we have the highest levels of youth unemployment in the world. Between the ages of 18 to 24, we have 74% youth unemployment. Just imagine that. It's very different still in Mexico. You've got very, very low levels of youth unemployment. We've got 74%. That means three out of every four young people coming out of the school system is unemployed. And they end up on the streets and they end up angry. And this leads to tremendous violence, just like you have violence in Mexico. This leads to, we have the highest rape rate and woman abuse in the world. Uh, Bob Marley said in his song, Redemption Song, a hungry man is an angry mob, and this is what we see. And when youth have nothing to do, when nobody wants them, nobody needs them, they just feel unappreciated, they're on the streets, what do they do? They cause chaos. And they do crazy things. Like last year, just for example, 400 schools were burnt down in our country. Why? Who would ever burn down a school? That's completely crazy. And yet they were burnt down by young people in protest, in anger, saying schools do nothing for us. 
Here's the incredible thing is every person on that slide there has been to school, every single one of them. School is compulsory in South Africa, just like in Mexico. School at these younger ages is free, just like in Mexico. But something is missing, and it's not helping our young people to be the successful people that they need to be. But Einstein said something very, very deep and profound. He said, everything is a miracle in life, or nothing is a miracle. And he said, it's your choice. What's Einstein talking about? I didn't know when I first read this quote. Everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle and it's your choice. Life is so beautiful. It's so unimaginably great. If we think of the size of the universe, we think what we are as a human being. We come from a little sperm and an egg. It comes together. It grows into this little thing, comes out of a mother's tummy, can't even lift its head or move its arms or anything. A few years later, speaking, jumping, starting to create and draw and think. And as human beings, we can create to the end of the universe. We can love to the end of the universe. There's nothing we cannot do. We're alchemists. Or we can live in complete suffering, darkness, and a hell that we can create for ourselves. And Einstein is saying that is our choice. Do we want prosperity for all, peace for all, growth for all? Or do we want to live in a world where we have famine and it's growing and drought and poverty and inequality and it's growing? A world with gangs and drugs and violence and death, which we see in our country, you see in your country, climate instability, war. Do we want to create a world of fear or a world of love? So this is the choice that Einstein's saying we have to make in every moment and this is our choice. And we believe that every child on this earth is a miracle. And we set out to prove that. And what we did is we said, we're going to create the first free university in South Africa. In South Africa, unlike in Mexico, we had no free universities. High school and, and primary school was free, uh, but university was very expensive. So only wealthier families could go to university. And we said we're going to create a revolutionary new university, which will be free. It will be only $12 per month for everything, including all books, tuition, food, uh, international certifications, etc. And we will take students out of street shelters, all the students that can't get into public universities because their marks are not good enough, they have no money, etc. This is radical. Why? Because every university in the world, they want to take the geniuses in society. And we call that genius in, genius out. So just think of a great university like Harvard University. We all want our children to go to Harvard, to Stanford, to MIT, Oxford, Cambridge, these great, great universities. Who do they take? They take 0.1% of a population. Nobody else can get in. And who gets out the other side? The person is still a genius. What we want to do is can we take average people in and turn them into geniuses? Can we take people that are thrown away by society, spat on by society, turn them into chartered accountants, great entrepreneurs, stockbrokers, stock investment bankers, computer programmers? That's what we set out to do. When we test our students, not only are they educationally poor, as you saw in the last slide, 94% of them are still at primary school level, even though they're young adults, they've all finished grade 12, they're suffering from tre tremendous emotional and psychological disorders. These are young people growing up in that poverty, with malnutrition, without uh, access to any kinds of opportunities. And we see this is a test that is done by the US military. It's called the PCL test. And they test war veterans coming back from the war. And our students, over 30% of them as freshmen, have the same levels of post-traumatic stress disorder as if they had fought in the US military in Afghanistan or Syria, etc. And we know that 10 times more soldiers kill themselves when they come back to America in peace than actually died in the war. These young people really are living in war inside their own heads. We also test something called depression, a uh, chronic depression on this Beck depression inventory. Over 40% of the students coming in suffering from chronic depression. These are young people who are lost, they're struggling to learn, locate themselves in the world, and to find meaning. Let me give you an example of one of our first students that we brought in. This is Klanganipo Chaliza. 
He comes from a village. He was brought up by his grandmother. He had lost his mother and his two aunts. 13 children, him and 12 siblings and cousins, were brought up by their grandmother on a very small pension of about 80 US dollars per month. When he finished high school, he couldn't afford to go study further. He ended up on the streets, and he ended up becoming a gardener, just doing part-time gardening work, cleaning people's yards, and he became a taxi driver's assistant. When a student like Langanipo comes into our institution, it is very, very innovative. So, you can see here for us, education, you can see one of our students here sitting here with his eyes closed. He's doing a kind of a meditation. For us, this is all about human beings, about their hearts and minds, about developing self-esteem and self-confidence. We call this education from the inside, inside out, not outside in. So for us, knowledge is important. Our students do business degrees, computer science, things like that. But it's not enough. Skills are very important. Programming, becoming a, being able to draw up an accounting equation or anything like that, but it's not enough. We need young people with great attitudes, leadership, passion, hunger, ethics, values, who inspire to change the world, who've got imagination. And you'll see our curriculum there on the left, and it's a very unique curriculum. And we've now won 33 global awards, 34 global awards, um, for the work that we do in education. So for us, it's about going back to what it means to be human. And now let me just show some of the results. I showed you that these students, over 60% of them are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a test, uh, a study that's been done over a five-year period on our students, comparing them with students at one of the best universities in South Africa, so this, the line at the top there you can see is students at this excellent university who are studying psychology, so they're learning about the mind from a book. They're also studying business and entrepreneurship. And you can see that after 60 days, 100 days, they haven't dropped in terms of stress levels. They haven't dropped in terms of depression levels. Every one of our students within 60 days is no longer depressed or on this PTSD scale. That's a very, very exciting result. It's now been published in an international British journal called Psychology Reports. And what does this tell us? It tells us a human being is not a fixed thing. It doesn't matter how lost any of us are, there's always hope for change. That is what this picture tells us. So I told you about that young boy, um, Klanganipo. Here he is today, 12 years later. He phoned me up three years ago on Christmas Day, and he said, Sir, I want to just say thank you to you. And I said, why, Tlanganipo, tell me your story. He said, you saved my life. He said, I grew up with these 13, 13 of us with our grandmother. He told me the story. And he said, one day I was up a gutter, and my old school principal came running down the road, and he said, Tlanganipo, Tlanganipo, You've been awarded a bursary, you're going to go to this university in Johannesburg, and he came to our university. Here he is today. He has gone from earning $400 a year, which is what he earned as a gardener. Today he earns $150,000 a year. He's gone from $400 a year to $150,000. That's what, about 300 times increase in his salary. This is the power of education. Thank you. The question is, is, is that a fluke? He was one of our first students. Can we do it again? So when he phoned me, I said, let's do a case study on where you're working. He's working in one of the biggest banks in South Africa called Absa Bank. It's the third biggest bank. They've got 30,000 employees. This bank, we found, has employed over 400 of our graduates. Of these 400 graduates, over 50 of them are in senior management or above. Every one of these 11 people are graduates of ours who've come from the streets, and every one of them is a millionaire today. So the question is, is that a fluke? I don't know if you know Accenture. I think you've got Accenture in, Me in Mexico. It's a very difficult uh, consulting firm to get into. We approached Accenture about six or seven years ago and said, would they employ any of our graduates? And they said, we must be crazy. They only take the top 10 students from the number one university in the country and the number two university in the country. 
To cut a long story short, Accenture have now hired 200 of our, 200 of our graduates in the last five years. This is more than from the best private uh, and public universities in the country. And yet, who have they been hiring? Our students, they're hiring people who've been gardeners, who've been picking flowers and fruit in the fields. I'll give you another example. Cisco, the global networking company, they do an annual competition. And this is done by universities around the world. It's never, ever been won by an African, not from Cape Town to Cairo. One of our students called Raymond, who had never touched a computer in his life when he came to us, he was the first African to ever win this global Cisco competition. He now earns about four million rand, he's a multimillionaire now, works for Vodafone, came from absolutely nothing. So, is it a fluke? This is where we're up to now, 19,000 individuals. We've taken 22,000 youth off the streets, from very, very poor communities who can't get into the public institutions. 70% of them are women. And these youth are going to earn billions of rands over the course of their working careers. They're chartered accountants, they're bankers, they're computer engineers, etc. And they're supporting 150,000 family members between them. Why is this exciting? It's exciting because I mentioned to you that South Africa has the highest level of youth unemployment in the whole world between the ages of 18 to 24. It's very hard to get young people into jobs in my country. And yet 95% of our graduates have been employed, and more importantly, over 90% of them have kept their job beyond the first year and then gone into permanent positions. This is very, very exciting for us, and it tells us that every person has genius in them. Every person has infinite potential in them. And that's what we set out to prove. So our goal is to do this 100,000 times so that no one in our country or anywhere in the world can say that one human being is better than another human being and that human beings don't have infinite potential. So now let's talk about Mexico for, uh, uh, for now. The World, Trade or, or the World Trade Organization and the OECD rates Mexico as the number one hardest working people in the world. That is, I think we should clap because that's an incredible achievement. <laughs> Why do Mexicans work so hard? They work so hard because they love their families and they want to provide for their children. They work so hard because they want to give their families everything. And they give everything so that their families can have whatever they need. Mexicans deserve the best. But now let's look at education in Mexico. It's chronically underfunded, firstly. So if you look at Mexico compared to a number of these other countries here, Costa Rica, et cetera, et cetera, um, you can see that it's been chronically underfunded. Did you know that half of the kids that drop out of school in high school in Mexico and don't complete school is just due to lack of a little bit of financial resources to buy materials, tiny enrollment costs, transportation to get to the school. Education should be a human right, and you've made it available to everybody. Education is free. So people might say it's expensive to get education, but ignorance is even more expensive. So, thinking about education here, and, you know, we're two and a half thousand people sitting in this hall right now. That's a lot of people. If we look around us, that's a lot of people. For the last two years, 30 million Mexican children have been at home, not in school. That is like our hall here with another 11,999 halls that are full exactly like this with 2,500 people would be that 30 million, actually more than that, children sitting at home. 18.5 million in primary school, 11.5 million in secondary. If that happens again in Mexico, if another pandemic comes along, we will never recover. The country can never recover from that, something like that. And if you look at, for example, the program for international student assessment, which compares education across countries in the world, 
And they made that quote there at the bottom there, that the poorest children in Vietnam are outperforming the wealthiest in Mexico. And friends, this can change. We can change this. It's absolutely possible. This is what we've been proving in South Africa with the poorest youth from nowhere. We can change this. This is what I was talking about. If 100 children start school here in Mexico, 90 attend primary, and you can see the whole way along, and we end up with one PhD out of 100 who start grade one. How are we going to compete with China? How are we going to compete with India? How are we going to compete with Singapore or Vietnam or any of these countries which is producing PhDs by the millions, engineers by the millions, etc.? We can do it, but we've got to add something to education that is missing. The talent crisis in Mexico is your opportunity, and it's a great opportunity. Why? Because according to the latest manpower research from last year, 74% of Mexican employers are struggling to find the talent that they need. What does that mean? It means if they could find the programmers, the experts in IoT, the engineers, everything else, there are jobs available, and yet there are so many underemployed young Mexicans that if we were to train up to fill that gap and close this mismatch, we would be able to have millions more youth in higher level jobs coming into stability in the middle class, not just in the informal sector. So the last thing I just wanted to share is how can we think about it? What do we need to do in education to create this revolution in Mexico, to create these exponential humans that we need to get this country to the absolute top of the world. In South Africa, I, I chair a national task team uh, for the government. We work with 13 million children in our school system, and we've done research on 50 countries around the world now. And what we found around the world universally is that education, like Ben was saying earlier and some of the earlier speakers today on education, the focus is all on books. 90% of the focus is on books, writing exams, and content. But 9% of the focus, but where all the money goes, is on how the students learn, which is the teachers, the process of learning, or maybe it's the internet, etc. But we're spending 1% or less of the focus on the actual human being. And this is what we need to change, because who is learning? The revolution has to be here, in the minds and hearts of every single young person, this is what we have to develop. So in our approach to education, what we say is we have to flip Maslow on its head. Maslow says we start with basic needs, and then much later in our lives, when we're 65, 70, we think about our life purpose, why am I here, self-actualization. We say, no, let's start a child's educational career with finding their life purpose, with self-actualization. If we start with that, then everything changes. Content is important, we've said that, but it's not enough. Skills is important, it's not enough. All the biggest think tanks in education in the world, in uh, UNESCO, etc., they talk about what, co you know, competency-based learning, higher order thinking, metacognition, meta-learning, etc. This is creativity, complex problem solving, etc. Even that, we feel, is not enough. We've got to develop ninjas people who are filled with creativity and inspiration, imagination, passion, people with action skills, ability to implement stuff. These are the youngsters that we have to develop for Mexico. Masters, not consumers, not people who are just using other people's products, people who can create anything. So how do we do that? This is a very, very interesting answer that comes from a great Catholic saint of long ago called Saint Augustine. And he says, people travel to wonder at the height of the mountains, at the huge waves of the sea. People are so interested in the world outside of them, but they pass themselves without wondering. This could be the missing answer in education, is to put the human being back into the equation. Because what do we want for every young person? We want them to be happy. But where does the happiness come from? From inside them. We want them to be leaders, great leaders who are honest and moral. And where does that leadership come from? It comes from inside them. We want them to have wisdom and courage. Where's it going to come from? Inside them. So what St. Augustine is saying is that education mustn't just be out there. Education must be in here as well. 
So good education, we have to have books. It's necessary, but it's not enough. Socrates said, know thyself. When he was asked about what education should be, know thyself. What did Shakespeare say? To thine own self be true. This amongst all else is critical. So I'm gonna conclude and just show that through the simple processes that we add in education, which are very, very basic, you can develop the brain, you can develop the heart of every young person. This is an electroencephalograph that's measuring, it's just a simple brain scan, um, checking the brain of an individual over time, and we can see on these different frequencies how the brain is starting to wake up, and all these connections are, Feggy was talking about this last night, the connections in the brain between the neuronal pathways. Let me show two studies on our students and our partner university. That uh, institution there in Orange is one of the top Ivy League universities in the world. When students come into this university, they are geniuses. There's the IQ at about 122, very bright. But after four years, what's happened to the IQ? Nothing. This is a law school, one of the top law schools in the world. This is a published study in the International Journal of Neuroscience. Students in this approach, which we call consciousness-based education, which is inside-out education, developing the brain, the mind, the heart, developing consciousness, you can see they start much lower, but over time, the IQs are going up 9 to 14 points. This is the school, the Marishi School, when I saw the study, this had been done 20 years in a row, this changed my life in education. At this school, kids who come into the school are at the 50th percentile of all Americans, but after five years, by the time they hit grade 12, they're in the top one percentile of all Americans. That's a miracle in education. Imagine if we could do that with every child in Chiapas, every child in Guacaca. We could. We could, let's test it, let's try it, I bet we could do it, where we could take kids who completely average and turn them into the future geniuses and leaders of Mexico. That would be exciting. <laughs> Friends, I'm, last slide, I just need to finish, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wanna thank you from my heart. I truly love this country. Anything is possible for Mexico. We have to humanize education here. We have to put more wisdom into education, more vision. Life is so beautiful. This country is so beautiful, which means education has to be beautiful. We cannot throw away our young people, not in my country, not in your country, because they're getting left behind. This is worth fighting for with every single fiber in our bodies. There's nothing more important. This is our future. This is the future of Mexico. And what I've learned is that no one else is gonna save us. This is what Steve Jobs said. We have to create an arc in the universe, a dent in the universe. The United Nations is not gonna solve this problem. They couldn't solve Syria, they couldn't solve Afghanistan, they can't solve Russia and Ukraine. Only we can solve our own problems. You as the leaders, the people of Mexico, only we can solve these problems. So I wanna conclude with a quote from Martin Luther King. Hatred cannot drive out hatred. Only love can do that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. We have to bring light into our education system. This is not difficult. This is something that we can do in a simple way, we've been proving this in South Africa, your young people have genius in them. Before it's too late, it requires open-mindedness, but if we wanna do the impossible, we have to see the invisible, what's inside the heart and mind of every young Mexican. Thank you.